Well, welcome uh, from Gareth. Now, I'd just like to say, if you haven't been watching on Twitter, following on Twitter, Gareth, or, or heard his news, it's interesting that we now get Sam as he's about to start a family. But <laughs> interesting that. Anyway, you see the size of the baby grey he's got up on the line outside. <laughs> We're also expecting a monster. Anyway, um, so lovely to see you. What a glorious evening it is. I hope you've had a great weekend. I don't know what you've been doing this weekend. Uh, I found myself up in London on uh, Friday evening uh, at a fashion show. I've never really been to a fashion show before, but it was uh, with compassion. I wasn't actually modeling or anything like that, but just there. It was uh, an unusual and interesting experience, um, but, but lots of fun. We love compassion organization that sponsored children around the world. We, I think we sponsor around 400 children out of this church in an area uh, uh, in Kenya. So uh, it was just, a, that was a great Friday evening. Here we had the hustings, and uh, I know that was a great evening for those of you that, uh, that, that were here that you enjoyed that. Uh, as Gareth rightly says, uh, yesterday afternoon, Gloucester managed to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat in the final moment of the match. It was the only time that we were ahead in the whole game, 42-40. It was a magnificent victory where we stuffed the opposition. And, um, and yet, in the midst of all of these amazing things that, that, that have happened this weekend, perhaps for me the high point of this weekend was uh, yesterday in this place. Uh, I managed to get across the rugby because there were seminars in the afternoon. But uh, during yesterday afternoon, we had a converge, uh, at, which is a, a, something that's emerging out of this church. And... Uh, and a gathering of students from both here locally and further afield. And it was such an amazingly energetic and powerful and present-shaped day. And I just wanted to say thank you to James and Rachel and the whole team that were involved in making it happen. Abby over there and all the team that you had around them. It was a great, great day and well done. And thank you so much. And in the midst of all these good things, of course, there is the, um, the, the tragedy unfolding uh, over in India and uh, Nepal. And... Um, it was right to pray at the beginning of this evening. Uh, we've just been doing a welcome tea uh, over there for those that are, are sort of new to the church and want to connect into the life of the church. And one of the things that I said there was that, that, that one of our sort of values or one of our maxims here is that, uh, and it's not original to us, it was taken from one of the early church fathers, St. Augustine, that, that we're called to pray like it depends on God and work like it depends on us. Uh, and, and in terms of what's happening out on, on the other side of the sort of uh, the world, the Indian subcontinent, that there is a, you know, it's a disaster, it's tragic. Uh, and it's good to pray and please keep praying. But as an old friend of mine, Ken Blue, used to say, he used to come here and speak for, for weekends. Uh, he had a world, you know, a, a, a ministry around the world. He'd say, don't tell me you love me, send me your money. Uh, and I want to encourage you to give. Uh, to what's happening out there. And if there's one organization I can recommend that the money goes through, then it would be Tear Fund. You know, go onto the, you can remember that Tear Fund, that's all you've got to remember. Go onto the website, just give to that sort of a disaster uh, appeal that they have there. Okay, if you've got a Bible, you may want to turn to Exodus 16. And as Gareth said, and as we saw from the trailer, we're doing this sort of series, we're continuing this series uh, called Finding Peace in a Frantic World. And essentially what the series anyway is I'm talking about fear. Uh, and, you know, I was talking about the importance of this uh, a couple of weeks ago as we were setting up this series. But it's interesting uh, to me, and I, I don't know that I'd really registered this uh, before, but uh, as I was sort of thinking about this and praying about this, I, I've noticed that there are 125 different commands and imperatives that, that Jesus offered in Scripture. And of those 125 different commands and imperatives, 21 of those had to do with fear the topic that we're talking about in this theory. So 21 times Jesus says things like, do not be afraid or, or take a heart or have courage. You know, the second most commonly repeated command in all of Scripture is to love God and to love other people, to love God and to love your neighbor. And, and, and that only appears uh, uh, around eight times. So I don't need to have a bad theological framework and think that because something is repeated more often than another thing, it becomes more important, okay? Please don't get that, okay? But what I think is really clear in all of this is that Jesus cares a lot about our fears. Jesus has a lot to say about our fears. And Jesus, why? Because Jesus understood how fear would impact at the way that we follow him. So again and again, more than any other phrase, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Now, now the goal of this series, Finding Peace in a Frantic World, okay, is not for us to use God to paint a fear-free life. Okay, We shouldn't make that the goal of our life, to have a 
fear-free life, if we make that the goal of our life, I can say prophetically, absolute, with absolute 100% certainty over you, that you will never have a fear-free life. It's not going to happen, okay? The thing is, God is not a means to fear avoidance. Uh, but the idea here is that we get to that place where we don't focus on how we fear less, but how we can trust God more. Because uh, you know, what the Bible would say is that, you know, it is that, that right now, if you feel confronted with fear, if you're feeling overwhelmed by some fear, okay, in different areas of your life, okay, you don't necessarily have a fear problem. You probably have a faith problem. And so the big question that I'm really asking us through this series, that I'm asking us as a church is, you know, is your faith bigger than your fear? And it's interesting that psychologists tell us that we're, we're essentially only born with two fears. Those two fears are, are the fear of falling and the fear of mad noises. Now, I do not know how many babies had to be emotionally scarred in that research to discover that information, okay? I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea how they discovered it, okay? But all of us are born, all babies have a fear of mad noises and a fear of falling. And, and, and I, I, I think that's true, but, you know, what I do know is this, okay, that along the way, beyond that point, we develop a lot of other fears in life. All of us have fears. And the first fear that most of us de- uh, develop in life is the fear of the unknown. And, and, and it's a pretty sort of generic fear that all of us have, and all the other fears, as it were, sort of cascade down and, and fall underneath that sort of fear. But the fear of the unknown is traced all the way through Scripture. And one of the best examples you know, of that comes in Exodus 16, where we are. So this is the story here of the Israelites. And uh, they've been in captivity for around 400 years, and God works through Moses. And Moses has to overcome some of the fears that he has to wrestle with, and we're going to look at that in a moment, okay? But God used... Moses, and there's this sort of string, if you've seen the film recently, uh, you know, of unbelievable plagues that happened in Egypt that finally convinced Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, to let the Israelites go. And from that moment that they started on that journey towards freedom, from that moment that they're set free and they begin that journey towards the promised land, God allowed them again and again to come face to face with a fear the fear of the unknown. And almost every single time, they failed the test. But they learned in that journey, they learned something about themselves, and more importantly, they learned something about God in this process. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure you remember the story, you know the story, but it's, you know, as soon as uh, they are released, the people of God are released, the Israelites are released, if you remember, Pharaoh changes his mind, and he comes after the Israelites. And, and there's this sort of, incredibly dramatic scene in scripture where you know the Israelites are moving towards the Red Sea and and as they get towards the Red Sea Pharaoh and his army are closing in behind them and they're trapped and uh, you know that you know they've just sort of watched God do a series of incredible miracles to get them out of captivity okay as it were that has led to their you know that's led to their freedom they watched all of this take place and you'd think that even you know that by now at this moment they would have a tremendous amount of faith in God but they don't and and they start to whine and they start to complain and it's like you know God, you know, why did you bring us out here to die? You know, why did you bring us out here to drown, as it were? You know, and then Moses points out his staff and the Red Sea sort of parts, and they they cross to the other side, and they're celebrating. It's like, God, you're amazing. You're incredible. This is extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then do you remember what happens in the story? They get lost. They get lost, okay? And, and, you know, and, and, and what do they do when they get lost? You know, I mean, you think they'd have some sort of confidence, God's ability to steer them and guide them because you know, God's you know, led them out of captivity. He's opened up the sea for them to sort of cross. You, you, you would have thought they would have uh, had a degree of faith that they might trust God in this moment. But what happens is they're scared again, okay? And they are paralyzed by this fear of the unknown. So God shows up and here's a a pillar of cloud in the day and he's sort of a, you know, a pillar of fire by night and he guides them on this journey that they're on and you, you would think that that would be enough as it were that right now they're going to have unbelievable faith in the faithfulness of God on this journey and what happens? They get thirsty. They get really thirsty and they're wondering where the next drink is going to come from okay and uh, you know, where is the water going to come from? There's this fear of the unknown and so God brings water out of a rock. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Anyone else here done that? 
you know, the water comes out of a rock, okay, and, uh, you know, you know, and, and you think by this moment that, that, that as the water comes out of the rock, they would be inspired by the goodness of God and the grace of God, and uh, they'd be propelled forward by the faithfulness of God into the future. You know, that despite all their fear, they would have faith, but what happens? They get hungry. They might, Gareth. You know, there they are. They're hungry. They don't know where the next meal's going to come from. They don't know where the food is going to come from. What do they do? I know that none of us do this. They complain again. They just start complaining. And what we see is this cycle repeating itself over and over again. And it's really important to note this, okay, that fear is a mind killer. And, and yeah, that's what fear is. And what fear does is fear erases God's faithfulness from our memories. And what, I think that's what's happening in the lives of these Israelites over and over again. So they cannot remember the faithfulness of God from the past. And so they're not going to trust him, as it were, with their future. So I want to show you what this looks like uh, in, in Exodus 16. Okay, It says this, if you're there, okay. In the desert, the whole community. All right? It's not like a few of them. This is the whole community, okay, grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Uh, There we sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So, you know, again, 400 years as slaves, they've been set free only for a couple of weeks, and what do they want to do? They want to go back, okay? I mean, it's incredible. They want to forego their newly found freedom, okay, which required them to journey into the unknown to go back to being slaves where at least they knew what to expect. You know, was it a great life? No. At best, it was only a mediocre life. But they wanted to go back because at least that was predictable. So here's the thing. Do you want to know why some of us are stuck in the past? Do you want to know why some of us keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again? Do you want to know why some of us are living lives of mediocrity? It's because we choose to. It's because we choose to. And I know that doesn't sound really very pastoral from the pastor. All right? That's why Tim's the pastor, really. All right? I know that sounds really harsh to some of you. But, but I believe that consciously or subconsciously, you, know, you have, we have made choices that we would rather stay in the predictable patterns of our past, no matter how painful those patterns might be, rather than take a risk, where we would have to venture into the unknown, where we would have to trust a God whom we can't see. And and that's what fear does to us. Fear is like a fence, okay? You know, it sort of creates these sort of kind of limits in our minds. You know, you know, we have, like most people, we, we, we have a fence around our back garden. I think when the children were smaller, I think it should have been electric, probably, um, in an attempt to keep the boys in particularly. But, you know, the, the, basically everything inside that fence when the children were small was sort of pretty predictable. You know, uh, we sort of removed everything from inside that could have been a possible weapon for the children to use. And, and, you know, we only had to keep half an eye on them because when they were within the confines of the back garden, they were pretty safe. Okay, They weren't going to get into too much trouble. Inside the fence was what was known. Outside of the fence was unknown. And this is the way that fear works. You know, fear always establishes these limits in our lives. So you fear heights. What do you do? You don't sit in the balcony. You stay low. Okay, you you fear outside. You suffer from agoraphobia. What do you do? You stay inside. You fear people. You stay alone. How many people here fear failure? You fear failure? You don't try. You just don't try. You know, whatever fears you have, okay, they always establish the limits of our lives. And and I, I think that's just one of the reasons why there's so much mediocrity around, you know, whether it's in our friendships, whether it's in church life, whether it's in our careers, you know, the... That there are a lot of people 
<clears throat> I mean, I come across this all the time. Again, lots of people, you know, whether it's in here, whether it's in, it, it, within the life of this church, whether it's down in the gym or out in the community, whether it's in a, a restaurant or chatting to somebody at a fashion show, whatever, you know, it's like, you know, do you love your life? I, I, Mark, I don't really love my life. No, I don't really. I, I don't hate it. I mean, clearly there are people worse off than I am, people would say. But, but it's not a great life. There's not a lot of joy in my life, you know. And I, I, I don't really sense that I'm doing what God has called me to do with my life. But I've, I've learned to live this life. And at least the life that I'm living is a life that's known to me, you know. And, uh, and for me to experience something else, you know, other than what is known means that I would have to venture outside of the fences or outside of the limits, you know, that, that fear has created. And, you know, I don't really want to have to trust a God that I can't see. And so there is a lot of mediocrity around and I don't think, actually, because I know so many of us so well, I don't think it's because that we don't have dreams. I don't think it's because we don't have goals. I don't think it's because you're lazy, actually. I think, essentially, it is because of fear. You know, it, and fear establishes these limits in our lives. And, and the fear of the unknown and the fear of having to trust a God that we cannot see forces us to live inside these fenced areas that we've created, where at least things are known, where at least things are controllable. Yeah, honestly, over the years, 21 years of leading this church, pastoring this church, you know, I've come across so many couples that are in challenging places in their marriages, okay? And I've said to them, do you know, hey guys, you know, I think we could help you. I think there's some stuff that you could do that might help you sort of make progress. You know, you, you, know, you, you might be able to sort of improve on where you're at. And people will say, well, you know, Mark, we're not really sure we want to do that. You know, I think we're going to stay right where we are. And I would say, why don't you want to go to counseling? You know, you know, well, you know well, maybe the counseling won't work, Mark. And people would rather stay in that fenced-in marriage and stay inside mediocrity, as it were, than, you know, and, and, or stay inside a marriage that is going down the pan really quickly because, you know, at least that area is known rather than step outside into the unknown again and trust to God that we possibly can't see and, you know, possibly take a risk with fixing some of the things that are wrong in our marriages again. Okay? You know, we're fine, we're fine, we'll just carry on going down the pan. I feel like Pilate in those moments. I just want to wash my hands. Except I can't. Because it's so desperate and it's so sad. You know, I, I come across folk who are, who, who are stuck in careers that they hate. They really hate. And it's like, you know, this could be you tomorrow morning. Oh God, oh God, it's Monday morning. I don't want to go to work. Let me go back to Friday evening. Let me have the weekend again. I don't want to go to work. And you hate what you do. People hate what you do. And, and so somebody like me, someone like Gareth, someone like Tim Hills, Karen, we might suggest, you know, why don't you apply for a different job? Why don't you do something different? Why don't you quit what you're doing and go back and study again, go back to university, you know? Well, I, I know that's going to create some complications. I know that. But I mean, what if you did something like that? What if you look for another job? Well, Mark, I couldn't do that, you know? Well, well why not? Well, I might not get the job. Well, why not try? Why not try? Did you know, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm just trying to say that, that fear limits our lives. We are so afraid of the unknown. So one of the things that I prayed consistently for this church over the last 21 years, okay, my prayer is that we would, that you would, that I would, that we would trust God in some areas of our lives that absolutely scare us to death. Really. Do you know Why? Because that's where real spiritual growth happens. Real spiritual growth takes off when your faith intersects with God's faithfulness. In that moment, you will know God like no message any preacher could preach. Okay? That is when you know God with real intimacy. That's when you know that God is really real. It's in those moments that God becomes so real to you. It's in those moments where you trust God in an era of your life that is absolutely scaring you to death. But because I believe that inside every single one of us is a life that is very much worth living. But we've got to trust God. And our faith has to be bigger than our fear. You know, the, the, this whole scenario here with the Israelites, okay, you know, I'm convinced that all these different things, that the parting of the Red Sea, the, the no water, the no food, the getting lost, you know, I, I think again and again what God was trying to do was he was trying to show the Israelites that, that it, hey, it's on the other side of fear where your freedom lies. That's where it lies. 
And, and, and here's, here's what I want us to realize as a community. Here's what I, what I want us to realize here at Trinity is that, you know, is that you were inwardly fashioned for faith, not fear. Fear is not true to the way that you have been wired. Faith is. And, and I, I actually do think it's possible for every one of us to learn to step into fear and allow that, that fear, as it were, to become the fuel that uh, moves us forward, that propels us forward. I don't think all fear is bad. But in fact, I, I think often initially the fear that we, we, fear, fear, we feel in life, at least for me, that that, that, that initial wave of fear is a prompt that I'm probably trying to lean on my own gifts or my own abilities and my own resources when really what I need to do is to lean into the only one who's ever had control, real control in the first place. So I want to get to go back on this sort of journey for the Israelites because this, this journey of theirs was completely and utterly dominated by fear. Uh, but it was a fear that was overcome with faith. So I want to go back to the beginning, okay? This is where God has this uh, uh, initial conversation with Moses, okay, about this whole journey. He says this in Exodus 3. You may, you may want to turn this. Okay, and now the cry of the... Uh, is, uh, Exodus 3, verse 9. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. This is God talking to Moses, okay? So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. You know, it's a, that's a very important point we need to take note of. Okay, this idea of I will be with you. God does not promise that you won't have fear. What he promises is that he will be with you. He will be with us in the midst of fear. That's what's happening right here again. This will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. That's what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. To which I'm pretty sure that Moses said, well, thank you very much. That's incredibly helpful. Um, that will explain everything to all of them, okay? And I don't know whether you see what's happening here, okay? that there is this initial wave of fear that comes down on Moses. And what's he do? He immediately goes to the what-if scenario. And, and, and you know, we have to understand that this is what Moses had wanted for all of his life. It had been his dream, it had been his hope, his desire, that, 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 you know, that the, his people would be set free. And, and God comes to him and says, hey Moses, I've been listening. This is it. This is the time. I'm here. Let's go. Let's do this. And what does Moses do? He says, what about this? What about that? And what about the other? And some of you have been there. Some of you are there right now. Some of you, you want to go on a diet. It's not quite as serious as leading the people of God out of captivity. You want to go on a diet, okay? And it's like, you know, you know, what if I go on a diet and I don't lose weight? You know, some of you have a, a problem with, with, with drinking and your, your friends come to you and they say, hey, Mark, you know, Mark, you know, you've really got an issue. And you might feel prompted to go along to AA. And, and then you're saying to yourself, but, but, but what if I go along to AA and I, I don't stop drinking? Some of us, you know, we need to get our finances sorted out. It's like, you know, why do we do this problem and we don't get out of debt? Some of you, you, you feel prompted. I, I felt, actually, I felt prompted to say this to some of you chaps, okay? Some of you chaps feel prompted, okay, to ask that girl out. All right, there's some gorgeous girls here, chaps. There are, really, okay? And Gareth's taken, so... Um, and, and, and you, you're thinking, but what, you know, you know, what if I ask her out and she says, I'm not going to go out with you until the hell freezes over? There's his fear. Girls, just be kind. <laughs> Give him a chance. Some of you, you know, you, you, you want to go for a new job, you want to apply for, your new, uh, for a new job, and it's like, but what if I don't get the interview? You know, what if this, what if that, what if the other? And it paralyzes us. Do you know, fear always trades in the market of our imagination. And so it imposes itself on us in the darkness and spins off into all these worst-case scenarios. 
So watch what happens to Moses in uh, Exodus 4, okay, Exodus 4, 1, then on to verse 10. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and they say, the Lord did not appear to you? He's still stuck in the what ifs, okay? Anyone here wrestle with what ifs? Just three of us, okay. But Moses said to the Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your service. And this is really interesting, and I wish I had more time, but I want to get to ministry, okay? But I think what's happening here is that most of you probably know this. Like you, Moses has a past, all right? In fact, for Moses, it was murder. Moses has actually killed somebody, okay? And, and, and you know, I, I think what's happening here is that, that you know, that, that, that what Moses, you know, Moses is talking about the, the fear of, you know, what if this happens in my circumstance? And, and this fear has gone to a much deeper place, okay? In my opinion, a much more dangerous place. This fear isn't about what if this happens with my circumstances. This fear is now about his own life. And, and, and this tends to happen with people who are really struggling with shame and shame is very I want to speak to those of us that wrestle with shame okay shame is very different to guilt guilt says I did something wrong shame says I am wrong and that's what I'm hearing from Moses right here in this moment okay Moses came to a much darker place where I think he's struggling with shame here and he's saying what if I'm not the right guy. I I, I mean, other people are acceptable, but but I'm not acceptable. Other people are worthy, but I'm not worthy. Okay, other people are gifted, but I'm not gifted. He goes on, I'm slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord says to him, who gave man his mouth? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, I will help you speak. Go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. And this is just God saying to Moses, hey, I called you into this. I'm going to carry you through it. I'm going to equip you through this. You know, Moses, you've got to trust me. And it's like Moses says, of course, Lord, this is what I want. This is my dream. I want to see our people find freedom. But I think for Moses, what's going on here, and I was talking about this a couple of weeks ago, that anything that God calls us to initially will involve some level of fear. And, and, and I think... For Moses, he, he, he wants the dream. He wants the goal. He wants the miracle. He just doesn't want the process. Isn't that true for so many of us? Yeah, you know, we want the dream, we want the goal, we want the miracle. We just don't want the process. Because you know what the process requires. Do you know, I was just thinking about James, he's not here, my eldest son who... Um, heads up Converge and students and discipleship year and all that sort of business. And he, he was so profoundly impacted by Robbie Dawkins last weekend that he knew that he had to do something. And I've been to the gym with him a couple of times this week, and it's a nightmare going to the gym with James because he doesn't do weights anymore. He just moves towards people and talks to them about Jesus. All right, and he's been praying for people's varicose veins. He's been praying for this, that, and the other. And he's been cranking up and saying things because Robbie talked about cranking up the wrist, didn't he? He said, by tomorrow morning, you'll be healed. He said, should I have said that, Dad? I said, well, you've said it now, haven't you? So, and if he gets stuck, he says, my dad's here. You can talk to him instead. You know, and uh, it's sort of this sort of... Do you know, who, who wants to see more miracles? Okay. It requires us to leave what is known and predictable and step out and trust a God that we cannot see. And for some of us, that's slightly overwhelming. It feels a little bit too much. Moses, I'm there. I'm really there, okay. Nearly there. Moses pushes through the fear and he allows the fear to become the fuel. And he will go on to become a leader and a rescuer of millions. And I just want to say to you, Trinity, you've got to fight the fear. You know, I, I think Moses got to that place, actually. I think that's where James got to, actually, where he realized that my fear is temporary. My, but my regret might last forever. You know, I, I may look back on this moment for a long time and say, why did I not trust God here? Why did I not trust the Lord in this moment? 
Because if you don't fight the fear in your life, you're not going to be present in those moments when you need to be present. If you don't fight the fear in your life, then you will not be the audible voice that needs to be heard when it needs to be heard again. You will not be compassionate when compassion needs to be felt. And your leadership will not be evident when it needs to be offered. And you will not be able to confront when you need to confront. And you will not be able to extend grace when you need to extend grace. And you will be lost in your worry instead of inspired by your dreams. Let me just uh, tell you, as I finish, what I believe fuels this fear inside of us, at least for me. It's when I take my eyes off God's love for me. That's when the fear starts to overtake my life. And I'm kind of sort of embarrassed to admit it, but I, I admitted a couple of weeks ago that there are things that I fear in my life. You know, as, as my children were growing up, I, I, I feared that I might do something that, that might get in the way of uh, my kids sort of growing in their relationship with the Lord. You know, I, I, I fear that this church might be culturally irrelevant to the 97% of people that don't yet know Jesus in this community. I fear that. I fear that I might do something that gets in the way of, of sort of people encountering sort of Jesus, as it were. And I'm sort of embarrassed to admit those and all sorts of other fears that I might have. But listen, I have seen God's faithfulness in my life. And I've seen God work in my life and in the life of this church over and over again. And yet I allow fear to erase God's faithfulness. And then when I get there, I can't remember God's faithfulness in my past. And as I get to that place where I can't remember God's faithfulness in my past, I have a hard time trusting him for my future because I've taken my eyes off God's love for me. And I want to tell you, as we are in the middle of sort of election fever, as we sort of have so much uncertainty around us in this country, as natural disasters happen around us in the world, okay, there are a lot of things that are in flux in this world today. And there are a lot of things in flux in my own life, okay, including my own emotions. So that one day I can feel completely confident. It's like, God, I'm here. I'm here to do whatever you want. I will take that hill, take everything, okay? You know, I will trust you. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do. And then other days I'm crazily confused and I doubt God. Anyone else like that? Just in those moments, okay? And in those moments I have to get back to focusing on God's love. Have to. There's this is great, great verse, a few verses in Romans 8 that have just been so powerful for me over the years in my life, okay? If, you're, if you are struggling with fear right now, this is one of those passages that's worth memorizing and soaking, okay? And this is Paul writing here in Romans 8, okay? I don't know if the words are going to come up on, on the screen, okay? But um, here we are. Actually, why don't we read this out together, okay? Okay? Because what we see here is, you know, I am... Persuaded beyond doubt that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know, whatever it is you're going through, whatever fears you have to battle through, Whatever limits you have created on your life because of fear, you can trust God. No matter what flux there is in your life, you've got to focus not on what is in flux, but what is not in flux in your life, which is God. God is constant. God's love for you is constant and unchanging. Amen? Let's stand, shall we?